Namaste. How are you? Welcome to another episode of the Cantonly Tales podcast. My name is Aaron Hegarty and I'm one of the co-founders of Cantonly Tales. We tell stories from Irish mythology and we set them to original music and we chat about them as well. We're coming to you from isolation with more podcasts from ever before. In this episode, we're talking about stories, about stories specifically made for kids. And we're also answering a few of the top questions we've got asked of late. So if you'd like to chip in in the conversation, ask us a question or pop us an idea, get get on to us and we'll get back to you with these chats. Um, if you like what we're doing, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. Or, of course, you can also find us with patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales for kids. It's all the same pot. It just means you're now searchable. Or we are searchable, rather, uh, because we're doing podcasts specifically for kids. You'll be able to find us on Apple Podcasts now, by the way. And you can find out more about what we're doing on our website, candlelittales.ie. Now, without further ado, we're chatting about stories and all the things that we do. So sit tight and you'll be hearing our live chat that went out on Facebook Live. We do this now from isolation at Saturday at one o'clock on Irish time to get some feedback and interaction with people who are online at the time. So sit back there now and enjoy the chats. All right, welcome to another Candlelit Tales podcast. I think we are now live. <laughs> we are coming to you from isolation once more, and we are figuring out the live streaming as well as releasing this as a podcast afterward so people can interact with us, ask us questions on a live way, or hit us up with a question after the fact. And today we'll be asking some of the top questions people have engaged with us this week. Uh, thank you for the questions so far. We'll also be talking about a few other things. Um, how are you getting on there, Surika? I'm getting on good. I just had an epic cheese sandwich for breakfast. Uh, I sent you a picture. It was yeah. amazing. I think we've all um, learned a valuable lesson from isolation. Things are better with a gross amount of more cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just more cheese. I recommend it highly to anybody who's like struggling at the moment. Try, Try putting... 50% more cheese on the next thing that you eat and see if that helps. It might not help everybody. Not everybody likes cheese, but you know. It's true, and some people I find can't it, have it. I find it good. And if you're ever making <laughs> nachos, be sure to put the cheese on top. This is something I found out last night. It's important to layer it if you really want the, the uh, most out of your cheese nacho. So, uh, yep. Sour. You got to have the gooey layer and the crispy layer. This is the important thing with, with melting cheese. Uh, many layers i think we've probably talked about cheese enough um but like by way of preamble it's fine um but this last podcast that was released was very exciting because this is an entire new launch of an entire new series entirely for kids and we've talked a little bit about like telling stories to adults versus telling stories to kids before yeah. on this uh live stream actually a couple of weeks back but um, Aaron, you like have always loved children. And when I say always, like when we were kids and like our cousins were small, you would have been maybe like 10, 11, seven, actually. Seven. Yeah. Uh, I can't, you were seven I years old when, when that cousin was a, was, a, was a baby. And like you as a seven year old were just like babies best thing ever me as like a think of what what was i if you were if you were seven i was like 13 me as a 13 year old girl was like what is it and gradually warmed up to the idea of occasionally interacting with them you know because they were they were interesting um and and got progressively more interesting <laughs> <laughs> but like you really always loved kids yeah uh so <laughs> I, I do remember like being being in restaurants as as a kid and if there was ever, ever a baby crying like I would just instantly just like want to go over make faces and cheer up said baby and um, I've always found like uh, like uh, 
yeah, I've just always loved kids. And I've always loved interacting and playing with kids and minding cousins. Uh, shout out to Keen and Elena, who are still big kids in my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Killian, God. Uh, but like, the the interaction with, with kids is always just like, it is the sense of play. And for me, I've always just wanted to play. And whether it's, um, as an adult, I've found that acting is a form of play. And as a career, um, it's just another form of play. And it's, it's just a more highly evolved way. But with kids, there's always that level of complete and utter spur of the moment play. That it's so imaginative and so intoxicating and so uh, enlivening. Uh, and it's it's something that's really beautiful to capture in the heat of the moment of like interaction interacting with kids in that like if you can play with someone and and find you spark their imagination and keep them on the same wavelength because we all know how distractible kids are but if you're able to create and i think to be fair to you you played with me as a kid more than anyone else in our family um you know like <laughs> the mufasa i used to call you because you had a big long massive head of hair and uh, head of hair you would snare like a giant lion if I pissed you off or pulled your hair. Um, it was scary. Yeah. And <laughs> like the play element that we, we engaged with as kids was a lot of fun. Like we did a lot, you know. Um, That's true. That is true. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I, this is this is the thing. Whenever I talk about children, I always sound like, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, I kind of have to be a little bit careful of my phrasing so I don't sound like a jerk. Uh, because it's not that I dislike children. Uh, I very much like engaging with children, but I suppose my approach with children is that I wait for the child to make the first move. Like I, I have been known to make faces at babies in supermarkets, but like if they make eye contact with me first, I'll respond. But like I, I don't have your thing of like, oh, it's a baby, must go to baby. Um, you know, I kind of tend to go, okay, there's a baby there. If the baby wants to hang out, we can hang out. If the baby doesn't want to hang out, I'm not going to, like, get up in in its face. It, it's, sure. you know, probably got a wise, mind. To be honest, yeah, a safer thing. Um, and uh, <laughs> I've heard you go off with glee in your heart because you're going off to play with a friend of yours, baby. So you don't hate kids. Um, I definitely don't hate kids. Uh, so talk a little bit about, because I've learned a lot from you in performance in terms of, like, interacting with, children and like doing shows for children but you also learned that skill set sure. so when did that become like part of your career and what were the the big things that you learned about like entertaining children yeah i mean like it's so it's so funny my first ever career or role uh acting role was with barnstorm theater company um down in kilkenny a brilliant theater company for young kids and uh for families built to kill me now because you're not even saying young kids because uh, they're they, they, they make shows for families and oftentimes for schools and i learned some valuable lessons being thrown into the deep end and like you know some of the stuff he brought he brought to my attention was you will see a ripple across an audience if you lose their attention you will literally see if you lose one kid and it's a full school auditorium the auditorium is filled with school if one kid's gone that literally ripples across the entire auditorium and you can sense it feel it because every kid goes hmm? like and it's they're hyper aware they're so in tune they're so much more like they have a, a another sense that we're, we some ways socialize ourselves out of i think in adulthood like and they're fully open they're engaged they'll talk at you more they'll let you know that there's something wrong if they don't believe you that you're the same guy that came on the last time you was wearing a wig. Like, you know, they don't let you away with anything. And so if you can get them on your side for performance, adults are easy because adults allow you that already. Kids are kind of going, kids are in the play already with you. You know, they're they're there with you. And so you really have to get them on side. Um, so Philip, uh, yeah, Philip was amazing down in uh, Barnstorm. And... Um, then Louis Lovett as well was, I kind of did a, 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 tra- a two-week training course with Louis, uh, who was an amazing performer for, again, young audiences. 
and he kind of took me under his wing then the following summer. It was my first real year in Dublin uh, looking for acting work and uh, he, <laughs> again, I did this bizarre quiz thing with him where he like, basically me and Sheila Moylet, another actress, went along with Louis to libraries all across Meath and Dublin and we basically make up a show based on a quiz that he had. He was this far-reached character um, he was, you know, a TV presenter. And he'd come in and just, like, grab everyone's attention and just blow them out of the park. And, and you can how, how are you getting on? And one of the key lessons he always ta- taught me was, like, he'd come in with this big character, funny nose, and spend five minutes talking to one kid as everybody is completely wrapped in it. And his basic first lesson is never jump your fences because you'll find something that is funny and if the kid finds it funny, if the kids find it funny, then that joke can last. That, that, never mind the joke that you plan, because that's not going to be funny. This here is funny. Like, and the fact that the microphone is a spoon and we're talking into it and you think it's a bit ridiculous and, and this is, is, is it working or whatever. Hello, can you hear me? Um, but that, that, was, that was Louis being amazing. If ever anyone in Dublin gets a chance to see a, a theatre love it show, unbelievably do. Um, and he definitely kind of took me under his wing in terms of like treating kids with like utmost respect and he was such a professional about it and so whenever we as Candle Tales went to festivals or were invited for storytelling for kids I treated it with utmost respect more so often than I did with our storytelling shows with adults and pubs because I was like dudes we will get ripped apart if we don't if we're not on it you know if we do not know every beat of this performance we can we and it's not like reading a book where you can go oh, no shush kids i'm reading from a book uh-uh. you know it's a live animated game thing that just is a lot of fun and that's where i definitely learned a lot of my lessons early on mm-hmm. and then interwove it with candlelit tales as well. and and i remember that like i really enjoyed that um one of the thing one of the first things that you taught me was like getting the kids names and addressing them as like small person uh, rather than little girl or little boy, which always sounds a little bit patronizing. And also sometimes that's not super obvious. So like, hello, small person is just there's a, there's a kind of a level of formality to it and a level of neutrality that I really like. Mm-hmm. And then it also allows you the freedom to kind of like uh, another big one that you that you brought to the table was this whole thing of like and and it plays into that thing of getting the kids on side was like um asking the children to police the adults oh yeah so like we know that you can focus and listen but the big people sometimes start talking because actually they sometimes do sometimes parents will bring kids to to a show and then they'll go and have a chat at the back of the room and it's a nightmare um and if you if you actually ask the children because they like kids love enforcing a rule uh on grown-ups because it gives them, it reverses that role for them. So suddenly they're able to be like, mommy, shush. Yeah, 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 I got yeah. you. Again, um, and, but, Sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask you to say more or describe the, the don't jump your fences rule. Because I know that comes from a story of Louis watching, I think, a Pooh Bear episode. So but good. just explain that a little bit more. Because it's, I think it's, it's such a good rule not just for children's storytelling, but actually for storytelling in general. In general, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, again, bo- all of those things that you, you mentioned there are all Louisisms, And, like, one of the things he always said was, like, copy and steal everything because that's how performance survives. That's how stories survive, to be honest. Like, you know, and it's a beautiful thing of, like, giving over, you know, you, whatever lessons you have, just pass them on. And he's so beautiful in doing that. And he does that so brilliantly. And, and, and the story... I'm sure he, uh, lots of people have been retelling this from, from his interactions. Um, he was on a ferry going to England and he was watching a Winnie the Pooh, but he was watching kids watch um, the episode more than, more than the episode. And, he, and the kids were watching this Winnie the Pooh episode and Piglet, they got to a fence and they were going off somewhere and they got to a fence. Piglet uh, crawled through the fence. Uh, Tigger jumped over the fence. And then the rest of the episode, essentially, <laughs> was Pooh trying to get over or under or through the fence and he couldn't 
And because it's poo, and he's just going to get stuck, and oh no, and he's going to get back down, he's thinking about it, he's going to get up, bang his head, or like climb over, fall over, what am I going to do? And like getting stuck again. And like the kids were at a not just laughing, like absolutely in hysterics, because this was just genius. And, and then Louis went, oh, right, it's not about the end destination, it's not about getting there, it's not about where they go, it's not about the adventure, no, 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 no. And it's so, it's, you know, it's, it's a Buddhist philosophy, if you want. It's completely about the journey. It's about the fence. It's about that moment that you land on. And if you land on something that's humorous, just explore it and just go it. And, you know, in live performances, you teach, you know, the, the, the leprechaun story is like if you keep eye contact with a, with a leprechaun, then you, you can uh, put him under your spell. And, you know, you just look at a kid in the, in the eyes for, for 10 seconds and go, okay. And then all of a sudden, you a funny fish. And, like, you can do that 10 times to 10 different kids in that one thing because everyone gets an interaction with it. And each time they love it. And sure, you spend 10 minutes doing one bit of the story. And sure, it doesn't matter because it's absolutely hilarious. And, in, in, you know, they're, they're on side with you and they're doing it with you and all of that. And then they know what's coming and there's an expectation for it to play out. They, they're comfortable in it. And, you know, we, yeah, I, I guess we can kind of give not give kids enough credit oftentimes for the narrative that they're able to digest but also we can skip past stuff that really is meaty and they want to explore it's the it's the fun and games of, of moments so yeah that's that's the ju- don't jump your fences rule nice yeah it's a great rule it's a great rule because it's such a kind of like it's such a good rule for like general storytelling and like drama is like don't you know don't get through the conflict too fast because the story is in like how you overcome the obstacle that's you know uh that's why the obstacle sometimes isn't actually that important it's it's how the character interacts with the obstacle that tells you everything about them and that's how you build characters and that's how you you know flesh out your world and flesh out the personalities is like when confronted with an obstacle that that is difficult for them, what do they do? Do they give up? Do they, you know, keep going at it? Are they running at it 50 times the same way and just trying to hammer at it? Or are they coming up with like creative ways of getting around it? This is where like, that's where drama kind of lives. And especially I think with, um, with Irish mythology and like very complex stories, there's, there's often a kind of a well i often find that there's you know and this is a thing that i will do in in performances sometimes is like if we have to summarize a chunk um it's the opposite of what you want to do when you're summarizing a chunk because you just want to get to like this is the overview of what happened um and and all of the fences are brushed over and glossed over uh so sometimes it's good as well to like find the times to slow the story down uh, although I, I do think it's a crucial difference between like adult storytelling and children's storytelling is if, if you slow down at every fence uh, in a story for grownups in a, in a longer, more complex story, it just becomes tedious because it's, it, it's so long. Well, I, 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 um, that, the, the key difference between kids' stories and adult stories is that what, like, the, the the duration of the story the like the like it usually kids stories will be a shorter but the narrative itself will, will be a smaller chunk so like you know whereas we can usually go into a bigger uh arc and and slow down sections of the story whether it's ku cullen taking up his arms or whatever, whatever it is there's a lot more in it but like the, the kid story is like how he got there or how he got his name the like little yeah. episode the little chunk and that's that's enough of a world to build and, and you just focus in on, on those moments within that story. And that can become half an hour, that can become 40 minutes, but it's like the, the, the narrative itself is, is smaller. Yes, and I think that's, that's, that's definitely a key difference is that you take, you take a lot longer to tell a much simpler story. Yeah. Um, so tell me about this uh, podcast and how you created it because it started with Rue O'Shea telling stories to his cousin in Australia and uh, then you and he started collaborating and then you started collaborating with Gareth 
And so tell people a little bit about how that's been. So this is an interesting one. So luckily I, I live with, with uh, Roger, another founding member of Candlelit Tales. And um, we we had talked, I, I guess, a few weeks into into isolation. I kind of, you know, one of the big d- desires of like going out, interacting and, and telling stories and stuff. I was really missing the fact that, and it was something that, you know, um, I was aware of a lot of parents being home with kids and gone mental or my own cousins gone mental for Una trying to homeschool her kids. Uh, hey, Una. Um, and like, you know, all parents are, are met with that difficulty at the moment. And I was just kind of going, God. So I just had a desire to, to, to tell stories that are interactive, but inspiring, you know, and like, and I still remember um, Children of Lear that was put on in the opera house. And I was like, it was just so beautiful and so amazing. And it, it evoked a real strong passion in me for something magical, you know. And I guess there was an an element of like ah, you know, kids at the end of at the end of term always have reading week, and national schools across the country do an amazing job of bringing in storytellers, poets, musicians, yoga teachers, all over all stuff, amazing stuff, you know. And kids are exposed to just a, a plethora of of activities and and stuff that they get really inspired by, and oftentimes we're brought in and uh, to tell stories. Um, I I got going with Martin Nolan, the musician who gets the has I've worked with him a number of for a number of years and uh, across Dublin primary schools. Um, because yeah, he 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 brings in the trad element and uh, he's a piper. But I guess the the desire to bring stories out and have them recorded and set and done, it's always like okay, I want to do it perfectly. You got to get over that because mm. you can't get it done perfectly, you know. Uh, you can't recreate the live performance. So Rue just said, you know what, I'm going ahead. And he sat down and recorded five stories for Cleana, his cousin who's newly born in Australia, and he wanted to uh, have a set of stories to to give to uh, his little niece. Oh. It was lovely. And so he kind of worked on that straight away. And I kind of sat down and I was kind of wrestling with how I wanted to, to piggyback on the work he was doing already and had done. And I said, and we drew out a kind of a series, a, a first three series, and made a plan to have a number of myths in each series, and a number of folk tales, and play with voices within them, heighten the uh, the music to be um, to be representative of more of what's going on in the story, not just atmospheric uh, music, but but also live foley and sound effects and the fact that we allude to the music and the sounds that are going on in the story. And therefore, we, like Rue kind of just found a whole other avenue of, of playing around in sound design uh, and mm. kind of through a cave here of like uh, of doing that. And we came up with kind of like the first story. Now, I broke my rule in terms of uh, taking a short story and expanding it because, of course, the first story put out is actually two to three stories in one. Um, yeah, but I couldn't help. <laughs> you make rules and you break them. You make rules and you break them. Uh, because what we, what I ended up doing for the Fionn story was, because I, I know a lot of kids in Ireland will have heard the Samuel Knowledge. And uh, they might have heard the boyhood story of, of Fionn. And they might have heard Fionn and the Dragon. Um, a lot of kids tend to go, oh, I know that one or I know that one. And the Salmon of Knowledge is one that is literally on the, the syllabus for kids uh, in primary schools. So I said, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of put them together and not just not completely focus on the Salmon of Knowledge, because I think it's uh, however lovely and beautiful a story it is. It's one of those stories that loads of adults have in their memory. And that's all they might have from Irish myth is like, oh, yeah, Fionn, mm-hmm. the Salmon, isn't it? You know, and so I, I kind of was like, yep. right. There's more to this than just the salmon, though. Like, he became, because of burning his thumb on the salmon knowledge, he then faced a fire breathing monster and defeated him and became the legend. And, you know, I think that was, in, that was a bit of me trying to, trying to align my, uh, my values of, you know, being a performer and a storyteller with my desire to 
spread inspiration and encourage inquiry inquiry into Irish myths and culture and just a form of getting it out there of course as well um so that's how it started I guess uh Rue and I kind of worked on uh putting voices I, I put voices to um to the stories that he had kind of done the reverse stories he had done uh he then like I would say like in my recorded story and the person said blah and he he'd cut that out and put in a different voice and um and then with the sound effects and like you know he hit his head oh ow you know like Rue was putting a lot of reaction stuff that you would be doing in live performance because Rue and I would have done a lot of these shows where we're constantly doing that you know um with like with kids so we're like we're getting them to 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 feel it out to to give us the sound effects of the wind of the of the monster of the of the dragon of the whatever and if they're giving it all of all, all, all of those sound effects suddenly without that and if it's for kids we need it a lot more so rue in fairness to him put a lot of effort into the sound design mm-hmm. of of this series uh, which is lovely and I'm, I'm really excited now to be releasing um we've released our first one and of course living with an other artist gareth curtis who offered to uh, illustrate and put put a bit of imagery into the the series? Uh, it was beautiful as well, and we had a bit of money in in the in the bank from uh, from our patron supporters. Thank you, patron supporters. So we decided to um to to buy Gareth an iPad so he'd be able to do them quicker. So our first one was kind of experimental. We're still waiting for the iPad to arrive, by the way. Uh, hopefully, it'll arrive by the time this goes out. Um, and we'll be putting, putting out more uh, illustrated um, stories of the first season. Yeah. We have the second season kind of done as well, and uh, the third season will be Cucullin based. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing all of those, and like I think it'll be until we can get into a group um, with kids, it'll be it'll be a, a way to fill fill a bit of that. Um, and actually, also yeah. um, Meath County Council. Uh, the libraries we were set to do a tour of uh Meath again we've done it a couple of times and they've asked us to they, whatever funding they have uh, is still there and they say look guys we and whatever entertainment they have they're having they want people to just to continue and do that but in a video form so Rune and I next week will be recording a few videos of live storytelling not just the recorded and the so we'll be we'll be doing a, a live version of the uh of the stories for Mead County Council uh, in three three little videos as well. And it is Not different to the adult versions for sure because it's more playful, you know, and it's 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 yeah, it's it's lighter. You get to have that bit of um uh you know, you go into being a big kid again. And I think that's really important <laughs> for, for me, for my sanity. <laughs> I have to be a big kid for a bit. Um, I have to just be ridiculous and put on voices and go cry oh, yeah. and you know run around the place like in like in Egypt because I will never not want to do that. Yeah, fair. Uh, we had a message from Magella McAllister. Hi from the Museum of Childhood Ireland project. Hi Magella. Hi Magella. How are you getting on? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice to see somebody else who works with children. Uh, yeah, and Douglas the, shared one of her posts that. before. Um. So thank you for that, uh, and yeah, I think like um, they they do great work and they they they're a fantastic um way of getting getting entertainment out for kids and they're they're brilliant at what at what they're doing. So fair play, Magella, for um keeping up the Museum of Childhood Ireland project. It's a brilliant thing to be doing, and I think like inspiring young kids. It's so good like to see kids in communities and be out in a um just gone. I went out to um to Kildare to tell the set of stories with families and young kids around a fire and you know they all had their bridge of crosses they'd all just come in from playing a lot of trad and they they sat around and uh, listened to the stories of Bridget and like it was just gas you know and like some of them knew about the the cloak oh yeah I knew that one and they want to interact with you again and but it's just it's so good to inspire a younger generation of storytellers illustrators musicians creators whatever it is by finding the magic in in the stories that is there already because like i think it's fucking beautiful when you can engage with 
with art and creativity and make it accessible and make it like, oh, I know that. I can tell that. I can do something with that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the glory of stories is that, okay, one of my favorite story goes back to Louis Lovett. Uh, one of our closing stories often is, uh, is the forgetful storytelling where you get yeah. the kids to tell you the story. And like anybody at home that is listening and I want to try this with their younger sibling or, you know, uh, their kid themselves just started off by once upon a time. <laughs> there was a yellow teddy bear. And then you tell us story about a yellow teddy bear who ate a giant purple uh, grape. Yellow teddy bear ate a giant purple grape and then he flew away on a chocolate biscuit. Chocolate biscuit. And forevermore, they told the story of the teddy bear that flew away on the chocolate biscuit. I really enjoyed the other. And kids do that. And kids will love it. They'll know that you're doing it, but also they won't because you fill in the little gap. Um, and it's brilliant. Yeah. It's so much fun. It's a great trick. Um, uh, Maria Reynolds says, can't wait for the live stories. Us too, Maria. Us too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, well, we will be recording. Rue and I will be recording a set of um, of uh, of children friendly uh stories, funded by uh, Mead County Council. Uh, thank you. Um, in in that, and we'll be putting them up on our YouTube page. So if you don't, uh, if you're not a subscriber to the channel, subscribe to the channel. You get a notification. You get an email. Uh, when we put them up, because uh, yeah, that's why. We're Yes, YouTube channels and uh, Patreons. We should now be searchable on Patreon under the Candle of Tales for Kids section because um, some people emailed us in a while back saying that it was hard to find us. And it turns out that if you make content for grown-ups and you tag this content for grown-ups, which is what main Candle of Tales is, uh, you don't, you aren't then searchable in the Patreon like internal web search, which is why we always spell out patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales uh so hopefully now we will also be searchable and just fyi yeah. to everybody we double check it's all going into the same funnel yeah it's all go it's, it's all going into the same place basically so if you want to support us whichever one that you find uh you can click that and if you're already a patron uh you don't need to be a patron twice <laughs> Fair. um in case like what I want to. I want to support this initiative too. It's okay. You don't have to. It's cool. I mean, it, it, it's interesting with Candle Tales, which is all of us, and Candle Tales for Kids, which is all of us. You know, and uh, it all it all goes into the same thing. And I think, like, I am, I have been, but even even now in lockdown, I'm more driven now to get content out for kids because I I guess I was just so used to the fact that we get the odd kid gig or gigs for kids with the odd school gig and. You know, it was just something that I was always fresh and able to jump down to. And it was like with kind of yearly occurrences uh, that it come around annually, whether it was for a beautiful celebration here or uh, like so, and always gets us loads. And always. summer festivals would always have a lot of kids, family stuff. And like, it would just be a case of like, yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. And you're always using that muscle. And now I was like, oh my God, we don't. And like, for me, it was just like, oh my God, there's, there's, kids at home not being inspired to do stuff and being <gasps> shouted at to do their homework oh no like we gotta we gotta, we gotta do something with that so uh like hopefully this giant story child to the rescue <laughs> giant, giant bearded story child um so <laughs> where I, giant bearded story child it's your superhero name um so i also uh thought we'd answer a couple of questions because people have been um asking us a few questions uh, of late and I thought they were really interesting so I want to uh, give a shout out to a few different people and um, obviously we're not going to get to every question because we get asked a fair amount of questions on Irish Myth and we do try to get back back to everybody when, when they do uh, and thank you for interacting and engaging and if you ever do have any questions pop them uh, our way or corrections we are not experts we are not full scholars in this we no. sort of um, I think you are you're more scholarly than me. I tend to go off on a random As as I said, I'm I'm better able to sound scholarly, but like I'm not I you know I, I I have not read everything ever written and I have not 
like exhaustively catalogued Irish mythology to the degree that people think that I do that I have. Um, like we we are we have a lot of exposure to Irish mythology, so we do definitely know more than um the average person and know more than ourselves of five years ago. But it's the other side of the Dunning Kruger effect where you're like, I now know enough about this topic to know how little I know about this topic. Sure. You know? Yeah. So it's like, cool, we know we know some stuff. Uh so by all means ask us questions and we will do our best to answer them. But like be aware that our answers are not definitive. Yeah, they and, uh, not asked us to um to retranslate a whole lot of uh, old Irish. And we're like, no, 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 we can't do that at all. We don't speak old. No, but we we might we might be able to put you on to somebody who can. Yeah. Uh, this is slightly. This says it's connecting live video, so I don't know if we may have dropped out of the stream. It always seems to pick up again anyway from where it left off. So I'm just gonna hopefully carry on. Um, Apologies if it's a the, bit glitchy on. Cream. Yeah, cream. apologies if it's glitchy. Um, Fortunately, in podcast version, it won't be. So we'll we'll crack on because we are recording on a on a different channel at the same time. But um, I wanted to say that we got a, a lovely question from Kira asking, and it was a brilliant worded uh, question. Um, you know the way into the uh, Game of Thrones has an overview of the the land from south and the map and shows you the world of uh of westeros and beyond does irish mythology have that kind of overview i know there are certain cycles but can you explain how they interlink because uh my knowledge of irish myths isn't very well around it so um i guess do you want to answer that question sarah <laughs> Uh, that's a, that's a very good question because I think it's, and it's actually a really interesting parallel to look at, which was something that I realized quite early on was that like, if, if you really like a very well thought out fantasy world, that's extremely in like internally coherent and consistent modern fantasy, starting with Tolkien and continued in that tradition by by George R. R. Martin is what does that. Mythology actually doesn't do that. Uh, and Irish mythology especially doesn't do that. And the reason for that is that when stories exist in an oral tradition, they're very consistent in the place that they're told. So like they're passed down through generations, but they're also widely vary from from area to area. So you have this in you have this in all kind of mythologies that start with it with an oral tradition. By the time they're written down, they're already very, very old and there's already a lot of like weirdnesses have cropped up and inconsistencies have cropped up. Um so you don't have that you don't have that coherence that you get when one author sets out and goes, Okay, I'm gonna build a world now which is what modern fantasy is, because it's not a world that one person built. It's a world that a whole load of people who never met each other all built a little bit of. And then later on, when you go back and you put it together, you're trying to like put coherence onto it. So it's difficult to, to kind of do that. Now, that's not to say that there isn't an overview to Irish mythology. Uh, you can... Uh, I think the the Bard Mythologies website does a really nice job of like dividing it up into the four main cycles, uh, which I think is a pretty good, like broad strokes overview of Irish mythology because you have like the the Ulster cycle, which is the the Tawn, the Cú Cullen stories, the the Crave Rua, the Red Branch. You have the Fenian cycle, which is Fiona the Fianna, which we have been really in for the last while and are going to be really in for the next kind of three or four weeks as we continue to work on the Battle of Entry radio play. Uh, and then there is the mythological cycle, which we've done some stories of uh, on this podcast. If you look back on uh, Kesser and Finton was one that we put out pretty early on, um, which is the story of like the first peoples to come to Ireland. And it is the it is the successive 
Goala takings or invasions of Ireland. Um, and then you also have the very little told um, king cycle, which Sandy Dunlop of Bard Mythologies has a great stat on that about how um, I think before Ireland was conquered, uh, before Ireland was colonized, a third of the stories told were king stories. And after Ireland was conquered, it, 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 they just fell off a cliff in terms of the number of king stories that were actually told. Um, so that's a really interesting thing uh, that like, yeah, that's an interesting thing as well. So you, ha you do have four broad strokes cycles. However, you start looking into those as with any kind of categorization that you're putting in like post hoc or that you're putting in like after the fact, uh, those, those lines are quite blurred. So like there's a story where Cucullin and Fionn McCool have a fight in Donegal. I don't know it particularly well, but I know it exists. Um, the, it, Cormac McGart, who's big in the King cycle as one of the wisest kings, is often an antagonist in the Fenian cycle. So like he's, he's in there as well. Um, the Tua de Danon, who obviously arrive as part of the Book of Invasions, are in all of the cycles because they don't leave Ireland. When the Celts, the Sons of Mill, arrive, uh, the Tua de Danon go under the hills and into the like the waterways and the wild places. And they, they are still there. And they come out and they kind of interact from time to time. And there's, lovely, there's a lovely part in the story that we're going to be telling uh, starting the week after next, I think, <laughs> we decided um, in the battle of entry of, of like, you know, the Fianna saying we are, we are being attacked. We need the Tua de Danon's help. And the Tua de Danon response being like, this is nothing to do with us. We are under the hills having a party. You can jog on. <laughs> um, so there is a like, I mean, you can divide it up into categories, but then the categories into cross fertilize and cross pollinate a lot. Let, let, let me try one moment and you can just like have a do, 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 going on in your own head. I'm not going to put it in there. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But like, first of all, the people came to Ireland. Ireland didn't have anyone. And then the people came and some of them died out. The giants came and they died out. And then other people came and they fought until the magic shapeshifters, they came until they went under a hill and they spent a lot of time beyond the veil. And then people came, kings and queens, and then they fought as well. And Ulster had a great, brilliant warrior and he was a legend and we know him as Cucullin. But then that Crave Rua, that red branch, they became less important as the Fenians. They rose and they became the most important important people in Ireland and they had some falling out with each other and other kings but then the people told the stories of the greatest the wisest and the best king and we try and tell them too today very nice should put that write that down somewhere yeah right. <laughs> I think Oshin will absolutely kill me for using the, the, um, the already copyrighted version of something that was something in this man's head he'll come up with a nicer rift for that but um yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. We might, we might be recording over over a track as like an intro to Candle of Tales or something like that. Good, uh, but yes, that's a that's an overview of Irish myth. Um, this is a good example of how you know all the details and you're able to articulate it extremely well, and and then I I riff off of you. Uh, <laughs> so we have got a great question as well by a man named I Love Yoga, which I just I love his name. Um. Okay. And he pointed out, he pointed our attention to an article uh, and said, hang on, is this, this, this is a bit of BS here, is it? Um, at the end, this article claims that Lear is the same as Mananon MacLear in the children of Lear, I should say. So the same Lear. I guess it's a good, uh, I, I responded to him, but I also thought it was a great talking point because in terms of how we piece together plot points and how we identify a character and a characteristic in a story and then go oh that matches this or that doesn't match this and yes these mm. characters have the same name but characteristic ways and if you know enough about them they they certainly don't but maybe you can riff off and, and tell us a bit more about the uncertainties and uh variances in, in irish myths 
Yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree with him on the on the Lear and Mananon MacLear not being the same character because I don't think they are. I think there's actually pretty pretty good kind of textual evidence that they are different. I know Oshin has been going down a, a Mananon MacLear rabbit hole for a while now, um, and looking into Mananon, who is a fascinating character in Irish mythology, yeah, yeah. and like talking about the Tuatha Dé Danann and the Book of Invasions and like. How the the land was there first. The sea was kind of there before the land, and Mananon MacLear is like this. He's not one of the two Adidana, actually. He's he's an older god than, or he's an older figure than the two Adidana. So he he interacts with them, uh, but he's not of them in some in some versions, uh, which is kind of really interesting as well. And his cloak, uh, he can shake it between two people to. Um, to make sure that they never meet again, it comes up in the in the the story of uh, the sick bed of Cucullin. He shakes it between Cucullin and the woman he had an affair with uh, to ensure who was his wife Fand to ensure that the two of them would never meet again. But it's also there's a version of the story of the two Adidanan where he shakes his cloak between the two armies, the two Adidanan and the sons of Mills, so that the, the two Adidanan are like that's that's how the other world is like made is him putting his cloak between the two of them. And that's how the kind of two Ireland's like split off into like magic Ireland and, you know, normal Ireland. Um, and so, yeah, it's the, the Lear in the, in the story of the children of Lear is a very different personality. Uh, he's very rigid. He's quite cold. Uh, you can listen to the children of Lear podcast that we do. I have very, I think he's, Arsehole. Anyway, <laughs> it's horrible to his wife. Um, and there's uh, yeah, I think Manon on McLear. Um, is the the in in that conversation he mentions uh the the cartoon Adventure Time, which I've also seen. Um, and there's a character in that who's a prankster and a trickster who's like the magic man, and he was like, "Is is this is this is kind of Manon on McLear, right?" And it 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 is true. It is like Manon on McLear is a trickster kind of archetype. Um, no, he's not a malicious trickster. Uh, he tends to lead people, you know, in the in the story of Cormac oh, yeah. McGart in the Land of Promise, like he leads him away out of Ireland. He completely tricks him and bamboozles him and kidnaps his whole family, but it is in order to teach him wisdom. And like he crops up in different stories, and usually when he is being when he's being trickster, he's not just doing it to mess with people. He's kind of doing it for a purpose. Or no, you know, sometimes his purposes seem a little weird. Uh, but yeah, he's a he's a trickster, and he likes. He he seems to be much more fond of actually interacting with people, whereas the two of the Danon themselves are quite removed from human struggles and strifes and don't really get involved. Mananon MacLear is like very involved in everything. Um so yeah, that's that's an interesting one. But like the trickster archetype is, is I think it's the first archetype you ever you see in any world mythology. The oldest stories are always tricksters. Yeah, and I think it's interesting as well to like even look at his name. Mac being son of and Lear being an old word for the sea. Like he's known as the son of yeah. the sea. That's what his, his name is supposed to mean. Of course, in modern day Irish, it doesn't quite make sense at all. But again, man on with that translation it seems to mean that he's more of a primordial god and is kind of around. But I think it, it like it opens it opens the door to kind of going, okay, how how do you examine how do you like your own place in and your the importance of interpreting uh, Irish myths being passed down from various different authors, right? And oftentimes you get uh, a red haired man or a little red man or uh, a character that says something brilliant or has a, an interesting interaction, especially if they're, they're one of the two, and you don't quite know who they are. But but if you piece together maybe their interaction, what what they're like, what their motivations are, and you know enough of the other stories, you kind of go, oh that that sounds like Angus Oak there, or that mm-hmm. sounds like that could be the dog day here, um, yeah. and then then you get into the whole new world of reinterpreting, reinterpretation, and and recreating. 
something that like is using the ingredients and i think that's what we do uh, and that's what I, we enjoy doing is like piecing stuff together taking a few ingredients mm. from from old stories it might be just a line it might just be something that we found in an old text and going there's something there hang on and and piecing it together especially the scott story is a great example of that of like we know uh cool Cullen goes over and trains with scott but we don't have enough about her and so we have to she's the, known as the shadowy one and we have a whole story that we still have to release from um yeah. from uh the woman of warriors show based on mm. just Scott, you know and uh that'll come out soon so keep your eyes out. i think that's on youtube is that on youtube yeah, we, we released a couple of the ones from February on YouTube already. So have a look at our at our YouTube channel, but we will we will be looking at releasing something else soon. Um what is, what is I it? think we probably it's it's just kind of ten to one now and the wind is picking up a little bit. I'm I'm a little bit worried about the door slamming, not yeah. having a proper latch on the inside. Do you wanna do you wanna do one more question or do you wanna do you question. wanna start? One more question. One, one more question. More question. One more question. <laughs> Before before the shop is gets blown over by the by the mad weather outside, we don't know what's going on. It's it, it's been a bit windy and also sunny. Windy. And also very warm and very me, giving me completely mixed emotions and, and moods. Um, so we got a Where question. I, on the other hand, as I mentioned to you before, cannot sleep because whenever the wind blows, I want to go outside. <laughs> um, so. We oh um we got a question uh, asking um I I, lo- I forgot her I didn't write her name now it was on a it was on uh, a recent post that I put up um of uh, uh just the call out for asking questions the question was would you guys ever like to do something with theater uh, getting actors to act out your the, the shows themselves I think that's something that we have certainly played with and tried to do and have done to an extent in fact we actually started out with a theater show Um, it was right after i worked with uh, barnstorm down in kilkenny uh, and we okay. wrote uh, the voyage of brian which is a reinterpretation of or the voyage of brian which is a reinterpretation of the the brand story um and i guess we've tried to do this a few times and we've tried putting voice to characters and writing it and um, we've moved away from theater being our, our prime drive because um although we have we, we moved away from her for a while and then we tr- tried to come back with it we have again your i think our interest being split a little bit in terms of myths and stories mm. and your interest in, in the wider meaning of myths and how they can be applied to society and learning and, and my just entertainment and, and theatre lens and stuff. I wanted to incorporate dance and shadow puppetry and, and movement yeah. into myths as much as I can in theatre shows. Uh, but this year, uh, to answer that question specifically, we would have been uh, releasing a work in development, Connell's Wave, in Galway Theatre Festival. That didn't go ahead. And we would have been writing one of our, o- one of our old scripts in the pavilion space in uh, Dunleary, which we would have been moving into in June to uh, to work on a script that we've been writing uh, called Katrina and Kyle Kuig. And uh, we've played with Bukal Bui, a, a small puppet uh, that I brought to the schools for a while, uh, telling, telling, retelling stories to kids. So we have done some. We are hugely interested mm-hmm. in it. And I think uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it takes more work, more funding, more... Uh, yes. Uh, the the thing about the thing about the theatre piece is has always been that like if if theatre isn't funded it is absolutely a labour of love because commercial theatre is extremely difficult. Uh, actually, having commercially successful theatre is incredibly difficult, and like that's kind of why we that's kind of why we steered away from it in the last couple of years a little bit more was just to try and build up the build up the 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 kind of the way I envision Candlelit Tales, to be honest, is like there's a there's a core spine, which is the storytelling performances and the podcast. And like the core is just straight up retelling Irish mythology with music. And then there are other projects that like are offshoots of that. 
So like that includes children's stuff, that includes theatres, that includes the kind of workshop stuff that I was starting to work on, uh, where you were going to be taking, this was, st- this was a project I started working on with Her Story just before the lockdown. Uh, this was to be taking um, kind of mythology as metaphor to explore um, sociological uh, systemic power structures and and look at how uh, our you know society is created and, and our and our agency within it um and like there that's that's another one of the kind of potential offshoots uh of the kind of core thing but the 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 thing that we also always have to balance as creators and it sounds it sounds very like machiavellian when you talk about it but it is a reality like you also have to talk you you have to consider being able to pay performers because we don't work for free uh, and we don't think it's fair to ask artists to work for free. Um, and like that's, there's so much pressure put on artists, especially when they're starting out to just do things for free. And like we donations is fine that I, I, I like the, I like the model of putting stuff out there for free and then asking people to pay if they can, because it, it keeps it accessible to everybody, which has always been huge for us. But like, we don't want to work for free. We don't want to not be able to pay performers. And if you're doing a theater project, like I think the first theater project that we did uh, within Candlelit Tales was like Shadows of the Tawn. And it was oh, like, it was Dream we still went to Mount Alley's main place. Uh, main that was space. the second one. Dream of Ethelin was the first, just to clarify. The dance show was actually the right. first. Right, yes. Project. And, and that, was, that was the year that we did two shows in one year. Um, which was way too much but also like selling out a venue meant that we broke even which meant that costs were covered but we actually couldn't pay anybody anything for like six weeks of creation and rehearsal and I don't think that's like I don't really and and I don't think that's like that's not the the fault of theatre as an art form that's like a that's a that's a big problem in the industry and there's also the thing of like funding is a catch twenty two where if you're if you haven't if you don't have a track record you're not going to get funding and if you don't have funding how do you build a track record except by doing things for free so like we focus more on building up the core part of the business and making that actually you know function so that we can then invest in the other areas because I think theater does eventually like theater does bring a return because it it it's much better in terms of kind of like uh this is me with business hat on but it's like you know you can do a big production and it gets your name out there and it gets your name recognition up and it's it, you know it's a different art form and you can do things in a more creative way and you can explore kind of bigger splashier things uh but unless you're funded that's not going to bring you back an immediate return so and- it's it's a Balancing and leads us down to the the avenue of like forms of creatives as well. Like, and I think our form mm. of creative is that we we get up and do, and we're not very good at being the application form of creatives. And I have so much admiration for people who are able to produce and create. And like, but it's it's a different part of your brain that is used, and it's like it's it's a brilliant. I think it's something we're we are working on. We're trying to get better, and we will be bringing more yeah. theater for versions of shows together when uh, we're able to i think there's also that like level of and it's the thing that i had to get over for doing that kids uh series is like the level of perfection you're never going to get perfection but putting something out there you know putting something big out there and like you know if it falls down short and like you gotta you gotta be free to fail and okay to fail and and redo it again and like but that you that's something you have to personally i personally have to get over and and mm. used to so there's there's a couple of things that go on with with the idea of theater um and i guess yeah um that that you reminded me there sort of when you were talking about uh the her story uh workshops that you have created design and uh, that are up on our website um about uh the article that you sent us that i, I think you should just mention briefly as well um the oh yeah um well uh, uh, a long-term goal for Candlelit Tales, and it's kind of a, you know, in in the spirit of setting, you know, a high bar and then reaching for it, 
um, for the stars. a long term thing that I've often talked to uh, to you and to particularly to Oshin about as well is is uh, creating a mythology museum in a central location in probably in Dublin. It would be in it would have to be in Dublin, really. Uh, that could be a hub for performances for grown ups for children could be a starting point for tours around the country uh you know taking people on mythology tours to different parts of the place but actually having a central physical hub somewhere in the city would be like yeah like i said long term goal of candle of tales because i think that would be absolutely amazing to have our own performance space and yeah i read an article this morning uh in the irish times about like making dublin a paradise i just want to have a quick look at uh, the writer of it because it was talking a lot about how COVID is uh, it was an article by Frank McDonald um, in the Irish Times culture section today uh, and he says Dublin could be heaven and it's basically an article about the kinds of pressures that have reshaped Dublin city for the worse in, in kind of recent decades part of this being that like you know, upward only rent reviews mean that local businesses are just going out of business and being replaced by multinational chains like Bewley's closing down has been the latest in that, but that's been going on for decades. And also the fact that like the city centre in Dublin, to, like at the moment is completely deserted because so many residencies have been illegally converted to short term rents and rented out on Airbnb. So like the, the heart of the city is dead because or is is nearly dead because of these things uh and because they've been allowed to happen but the move for consumers to to online has been like massively accelerated during the lockdown but it that that tide is not really going to turn back um so yeah he goes into an interesting thing about like it's it's probably not retail uh that is the future of buildings in the city center and, and like some imagination and creativity is required. But one of the things he mentioned in that was, you know, capital values of retails. Uh, this is a quote from somebody called John Corcoran, who says capital values for retail have collapsed and the future looks bleak other than for services such as hairdressers, nail bars, restaurants and entertainment venues. And that made me go, oh, that's OK. That doesn't sound terrible to me. Nope. You know, a city full of, you know, some interesting, probably a couple of interesting retail stores will be able to survive. Uh, but like a, a city center full of cafes, bars, restaurants, entertainment uh, venues and like cultural venues. That sounds pretty cool to me. That's I'm awesome. I'm I think that sounds pretty dope. I, I like that. If I like that plan. If, of course, like the whole rent situation can just be completely uh, but we'll see well this is that was the argument that he was making is that like you know rents long term rents are going to have to come down in city centres because they are not able to generate that kind of income anymore sure. and like the idea of, of set of tying rents to a company's turnover rather than having like just a set you know you've got to pay millions for this retail space when it's just not sustainable at the moment um, and well, like when footfall isn't there and I think I think that's just like even even in now like the positive thing to be kind of like you know what out of this the world can change for the better. And I know my one of my housemates yeah. was a little bit down yesterday because uh, it feels like the world is not going to be much better after this. But it's always a yin and a yang, and it's always you always have to take positive with negative, and you always have to have a, a lens to view negative things through. And maybe when we come out of this. We can generate something that's more positive and change. Yeah. Um, Rebecca Lee was the girl who asked us, woman who asked us about theatre. Thanks for that. Shout out to you. Shout out to Robert who just uh, started watching, and I uh, ho hope you're getting on a great musician over in England. And en Antonella Sullivan, speaking of uh, tourism and tourists, uh, just a shout out to you as well. Who uh, popped a question onto the Facebook page as well, uh, or a, a comment, I should say, uh, saying that Bard Mythologies is a brilliant. Uh, source for explaining the cycles of mythology and us guys too and I uh, helped her out in her tour guiding ability so delighted that that's a help for you hope you're all keeping healthy keeping safe keeping sound keeping the stories alive and creating mm -hmm. some stories to retell in your own home and uh, we'll catch you next and time and 
Yeah, and on the world changing for the better in the wake of this crisis, um, I think as we are all starting to, well, you know, we're starting to open up in Ireland now. But as we reopen, just like keep the keep the focus on keep the focus on what you've realized is important to you, because that's on all of us. That's all of us that can can make that happen. We don't have to go back to bad habits that we don't want to go back to. So try and uh, try and keep your eye on what you care about as you're going back out into world. not isolation. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Very good positive note to end on. Thanks, Sorica, and thanks for listening. Uh, keep her lit, lads. Keep her candle lit. <laughs> Salon, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much, guys. This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan. The chats were by myself, Aaron Hegarty, and my sister, Sorica Hegarty. So, thanks very much. Once again, I'll just remind you, you can go to candletales.ie follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and we are hashtag candletales hashtag keep or candlelit or hashtag candlelittletales if you want to follow what we're doing for younger audiences so please subscribe to those channels if you don't follow us on YouTube and subscribe come on be grand there's more content going up there more than ever before so if you want to keep up to date Liking and sharing, subscribing to these channels really helps us grow and get to more people. So if you're able to give us a little bit of a thumbs up, that'd be great. Yeah, Uh, we'll be releasing a story next week. This week was a chat and I guess in isolation we've been doing two podcasts a week, actually. A story and a chat. And we've decided to focus a lot on the battle of entry. We're putting a lot of research and uh, Foley music and voices uh, specifically for the Battle of Entry, the great Fianna epic. So if you want to find that and tune into it, it'll be coming very, very soon once we all click in together. We've it nearly completed now. It's been a lot of work, but we're really enjoying it. And if you want to help us with this type of work, and help us in terms of sharing and liking, that's great too. If you want to chip in a few bob, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or forward slash candlelit tales for kids. They're one and the same. They go straight to us. You can also make a one-off donation through PayPal button on our website. Sure, you know, there's no, no pressure. We'll be going on and keeping on and keeping her lit, and I hope you're keeping safe, keeping sound, keeping healthy. That's all from us from Candlelit Tales. Chat to you soon. Salon.